Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Columbia University, the School of Professional Studies, and in particular, our new Masters in Wealth Management program, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this, our third speaker series event, where from time to time, we'll ask industry leaders to come and join us and share their thoughts and perspectives on the fast evolving wealth management industry. My name is Philip Hecker. I'm a senior advisor to the program and I'll be your moderator today. Working hard behind the scenes, thanks go to Tracy Schwartz, our wonderful interim program director and Peter Lee and his team for covering technology. With respect to our topic today, the US is blessed with an abundance of choice when it comes to wealth management business models. As a recent page and analysis from Cerulli Associates shows, in the US, the wealth management industry is large in terms of assets and relationships. And furthermore, as you can see in the columns, it is also very fragmented when it comes to different business models serving the needs of different wealth management clients and investors. We look forward today to getting the first-hand perspectives from three leading CEOs on the dynamics of the industry at large and with respect to their business model in particular. But before I introduce our wonderful CEOs who will really bring this topic to life, allow me a few short words on our new program and let me give you a feel for the arc of today's discussion. Columbia University's new Masters in Wealth Management is a 16-month online part-time program that equips existing and aspiring wealth management professionals with everything they need to meet the many disruptive challenges and opportunities that our industry provides. It is currently the only master's program offered by an Ivy League institution and it also equips our students with all the educational requirements to attain the certified financial planner designation. Should you wish to learn more, simply type Columbia University and wealth management into a web browser of your choice. With respect to the arc of today's discussion, we'll have a 40 minute or so panel conversation on the trends in the industry and the particular nuances of the different business models, both from a client and employee point of view. Then we'll shift gears into a dynamic Q&A. Please folks, as we walk along, please use the live chat function on the right of your screens to submit your questions. And I'll be feeding them to our panelists towards the end. And with that, it is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our three CEOs. Of course, ladies first, Melinda Davis. Melinda is the founder and CEO of Davis Wealth Advisors, a boutique RAA up in Bedford, New Hampshire. Mindy works primarily with business owners, thriving retirees, and stewards of family wealth. And she sees her firm oftentimes acting as a family CFO. Welcome, Mindy. We're glad to have you. Thanks then for having me here. Then we have Hike Arian. Hike serves as president of Alex Brown, which, as many of you know, is America's oldest investment bank, now focusing on wealth management and private market investing for wealthy individuals and family offices. Hike is also head of Raymond James's global wealth solution platform, which provides all the products and solutions to more than 7,400 Raymond James financial advisors nationwide. Hike, thank you for taking the time. Last not least, we welcome Jeff Whitaker. Jeff was recently announced as president and CEO of Chevy Chase Trust a 36 billion trust company headquartered in beautiful Bethesda, Maryland. All avid readers of the American financial press will have picked up on the wonderful portrait that Barron's did this weekend. And Jeff, we look forward to hearing more about Chevy Chase Trust and your approach to thematic investing in today's conversation. Welcome you all, great to have you. 
as we dive in, let's perhaps get to know you on a personal level even better. Quick ice-breaking speed round, quick questions, quick answers, sequence always being Mindy, hi, Jeff. First off, Mindy, favorite podcast, favorite TV show these days, what do you have? Uh, probably the Tim Ferriss show uh, is my favorite podcast. I don't, I don't get to watch a lot of TV. Excellent. Mike. Favorite TV show is Ted Lasso. And favorite podcast, as I listen to so few, is one from one of our financial advisors named Zach Garber. Excellent. I actually remember him. Jeff? Well, uh, Hike stole my answer. Um, I'm uh, also a um, fan of Ted Lasso. Uh, and on the podcast front, uh, one of my hobbies is uh, uh, I'm a private pilot, and so I'll uh, listen to a number of aviation-related podcasts. My favorite right now is called the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Wonderful tips. Thank you all. Next best big travel destination, what do you all have in mind? What's on your radar? Mindy? I got to say, with with COVID, I haven't been going. All of our travel plans got uh, got canceled. So right now, probably just going to visit my daughter out at, at, at the college that she's attending. Hi. This Thursday, I'm flying to Kohler, Wisconsin for the Ryder Cup. That is my next big travel destination. Awesome. Wonderful. Enjoy. Jeff, where are you flying? Uh, you know, we're working off quite a few... Um, uh, flight credits from cancellations earlier in the pandemic and uh, planning to use a number of those to go back out to uh, the Salt Lake City area and uh, ski Alta and Snowbird. Excellent. Godspeed and joy. Last icebreaker question. If you could pick one person, anyone, to spend a dinner with, who would it be? For me, it would be RBG if we could bring her back. Uh, I think... Uh... I just would love to spend some time with her. Wonderful. My answer is going to seem a little bit uh, staged, and but it's honest. Uh, it's my wife. Wonderful. Jeff, tough shoes to follow. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, wow, that is a tough one to follow. Uh, you know, um, I would say, uh, I, you know, kind of uh, any any figure uh, living or, or not, uh, Eisenhower, uh, whose leadership style um, and sense of responsibility I always really admired. And then uh, if it's someone who is still with us, uh, Walter Isaacson, uh, we actually had him for uh, a client event maybe six months ago uh, discussing um, the subject of a new book. And I just found the conversation so engaging. I, I kind of wanted him all to myself. So if I had the chance to grab dinner with him, I think um, I'd certainly learn a lot from it. All interesting choices. Thank you for those. Let's shift gears into our first round of discussion. Let's bring to life your respective business models and your respective firms. Let's go around the horn, two minutes or so per person. Please bring to life your particular business model how would you explain it to a prospect? Mindy first. So uh, we really offer a fractional family office uh, to our clients. Our clients are busy, um, they're very successful, and they don't want to spend their time doing paperwork, coordinating with all their other advisors. So we really are the whole holistic quarterback, or we call ourselves a family CFO, um, who really provides uh, that 5,000 foot view, helps develop a vision and a strategy, a shared strategy between the couple, um, and then helps them execute on that. Wonderful. If we were to meet literally in the proverbial elevator, what would be your 20 second pitch? My 20 second pitch, probably, um, you know, if you look at our website, it says, you know, live life without regrets. Uh, our goal is to help be that thinking partner there for people so that they can make quick decisions, um, that they can do the things that they enjoy the most and change change the world in their own unique way. Um, and that we sort of take the important things, but not interesting things uh, off their plate. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Hike over to you. Please bring to life maybe first Alex Brown and then Alex Brown as part of the larger Raymond James. Great. Thank you, Philip. Alexander, I will answer it exactly like that. As you mentioned, I have two main roles as the president 
of Alex Brown. We are a $78 billion assets under administration, under administration wealth manager. Uh, we service predominantly high net worth and ultra high net worth clients. So we pride ourselves on bringing a sophisticated uh, solution to our clients, irrespective of what their individual needs are. Custom tailored uh, <coughs> approach, uh, not quite uh, a, a family office type of approach. Uh, although many of the advisors aspire to do that, we support um, approximately 220 financial advisors, each one who has a bespoke way of delivering uh, their very important service to clients. But for Alex Brown, and it has been historically, even during Deutsche Bank's uh, ownership, a, a wealth management platform that catered to high net worth uh, uh, families and rather sophisticated investors. Uh, in my role in, within Raymond James as the head of Global Wealth Solutions, we support the breadth of the wealth uh, uh, strata. So from mass affluent all the way through ultra high net worth, Raymond James is uh, one of the largest wealth management firms in the United States. One of the uh, core principles of the business model is known as advisor choice, meaning advisors can affiliate with Raymond James with whatever structure they see fit for their practice. In the initial Cerulli slide you put up, uh, Philip, I think it's really important um, for the group to, to understand that Raymond James, actually one of the core parts of the business model is that we can serve in each one of those strata other than private bank, we can support any of those affiliation models. So advisors can be employee, they can be independent, they can be an RIA, uh, they can be affiliated with a financial institution such as a bank, and we will deliver the breadth of the platform. It's that platform that I'm responsible for. And it really does empower uh, advisors to customize a bespoke solution uh, for the type of client they choose to serve. Excellent. That flexibility from an employee point of view, let's make a mental note and get back to that when we take the employee lens on the business models. Let me ask you the same question as Mindy. Assume we meet in an elevator, what would be your 22nd pitch? So my 22nd pitch, if I'm pitching uh, 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 regarding Alex Brown, um, we are a sophisticated solutions provider for demanding clients uh, who are in the high net worth space. If I'm pitching Raymond James, it's the breadth of the organization with over $1.2 trillion in assets under administration, the ability to use a strong balance sheet, um, and, if, and the ability to serve uh, clients of uh, throughout uh, all of the wealth demographics. So as you saw, my pitch might be to a client and my pitch might be to a financial advisor to affiliate with us. So there's two core parts of the business model in, in each case, which is acquiring clients and of course, affiliating with multiple financial advisors. And that dual lens between client and employee will keep us busy today. So thank you for teasing it out that way. Jeff, please bring us home. Great. Uh, so Chevy Chase Trust is a, a privately owned boutique investment manager. Philip mentioned we're headquartered in Washington, DC. Um, we provide tailored discretionary investment management, uh, planning and trust services to families and institutions. Um, you know, a number of the things that I think are quite distinct about us, um, we are uh, a, a longstanding practitioner of thematic investing. We've been doing it for more than two decades. Uh, we've built what we regard as a very robust process centered around uh, investing in individual securities, individual stocks on the equity side. Um, and um, we've um, got a, a history of consistent strong returns there. Um, I'd say among the things that distinguish us, you know, uh, in, in the prior uh, slide that, that Philip referenced, uh, there, there are quite a few investment advisors or registered investment advisors in the United States. I think uh, uh, well, well over 10,000. Um, one of the things that distinguishes us is the, um, the depth and breadth of our trust planning and uh, fiduciary services that really allow us to um, work with a client uh, and family effectively through generations uh, and to really be there for them both um, in, in the context of um, investing in wealth building um, and also uh, in, in a broader sense to help them achieve their, their family's longer term objectives. Excellent. Thank you all for sharing that. I've known some of you for quite some time. I know the interesting journeys that you have taken from where you started to where you are today. 
would you mind maybe in the same order, Mindy, Hyde, Jeff, sharing with our audience your particular journey? How did you find your way into the industry? How have you gotten to where you are today? Sure. So, you know, my, my path is, um, is really where my passion came from. So I have an undergraduate degree in finance and I have a master's degree in finance and I was working in corporate finance at the time in high tech. Um, and my husband and I, we had gotten married, we wanted to start a family and we went to hire an advisor and we got a recommendation from someone didn't understand that you should actually call the actual person not the company um and had a really bad experience um you know we we uh, had someone create a financial plan for us um but we didn't understand we didn't ask the right questions um and my husband has a few masters in engineering we're both smart people um, and i realized when i was staying home with my kids that we were put in very expensive investments that maybe weren't appropriate for us um, and what do you, you know, I got, I got angry. So what I did was I decided when I went back to work that I was going to go, um, go into this field and use my finance knowledge to help people. And personal finance is very different than corporate finance, but what's worked well, well for me is I specifically work with business owners because I have that corporate finance background. So I'm really able to marry their business uh, finances and their personal finances, which as most of us know, uh, if you know business owners, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so that's really helped me along the way. Um, but that that's how I got started. I started off at Morgan Stanley. I thought I really needed to be at a big firm um, to learn and get my feet wet. And it, it took me a while um, to realize what fee only advisors were. And, um, and I've been working in fee only since about 2014 and started my firm in 2017. Um, but it was really just from, uh, from a bad advisor experience that motivated me to, to want to, to go into that field. Anger and disappointment can be a strong catalyst. Thank you for sharing that. Hi, over to you. Uh, so, you know, Mindy's experience, um, a bad advisor experience is all too prevalent uh, over the past 30 years in, in, uh, in our country and in our profession. It doesn't lead most people <clears throat> to become wealth management professionals themselves. And I think that's really admirable. Um, uh, but uh, I can tell you the reason I make that comment, when I started in this, uh, in this profession, I was going to Rutgers University and at night, I used to go to the local Dean Witter office, which was Morgan Stanley's predecessor mm -hmm. firm. And I would cold call for a few financial advisors for five or six dollars an hour. It was actually my job during college. They made me an offer to join them once I graduated from Rutgers University. And I did. And essentially, my job was a telemarketer. And I came to realize very shortly thereafter that success was being measured in this profession by the amount of production you did. It was not being measured by the experience your clients were having or the skill set that you brought. Uh, to your craft as, as a wealth manager and a wealth advisor. Uh, so shortly thereafter, I looked to make a change um, from the wirehouse model. And, and what I'm saying nowadays, by the way, the wirehouse has evolved greatly to be much better um, providers of these services. But I wanted to go <clears throat> more into a firm that had capital markets, balance sheet driven business and more of a high net worth pedigree. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be hired by Alex Brown and Sons in 1995. And I've essentially been at that firm now for 26 years through the ownership of Bankers Trust, through the ownership of Deutsche Bank, and now the ownership of Raymond James. Um, but uh, they were, my core route was as a financial advisor, even when I joined Alex Brown and Sons, it wasn't until 2001 that I did in fact go into management. And uh, my management track um, uh, led me to uh, the role I'm in today as the CEO of that business for Raymond James. Great. Um... You know, my, my my path into the profession, I think, was a little bit uh, atypical. I've spent my entire career uh, in and around wealth management and investment management, uh, but initially as a, a strategy consultant and advisor to uh, a lot of businesses in this space. Um, but uh, basically moving from being an advisor to businesses to being an operator within them. Uh, and that's uh, an experience that took me through both um, turnaround situations, uh, growth um, uh, strategies, and gave me exposure to a lot of different operating models in the business from commission brokerage to um, more traditional private banking and um, fee-based investment advisory. Uh, and I think that um, 
maybe a higher level scan of the broader industry, uh, and then the experience of working directly in a number of those models um, is something that really gave me an incredibly uh, high level of conviction in the fee-based uh, fiduciary oriented investment advisory model where, um, uh, you know, you know, no, no, no profession and no aspect of a profession is entirely perfect. But um, the way that um, I saw that um, bringing the incentives of the organization and the individual advisor um, very much in line with the um, the interests of the client uh, was something that really appealed to me. Uh, and I, I think it also uh, can be the foundation for um, a much longer term, uh, deep and broad relationship between um, a family or an individual and a trusted advisor and a trusted firm. Uh, and I think that that's an arrangement that um, really creates a, a tremendous amount of value for, for the client uh, through that, that longevity and that trust and that experience. Uh, so again, I, I traveled uh, really from uh, a strategy consulting firm, BCG, where I did a lot of work in wealth management, uh, and then uh, eventually to Deutsche, where I worked with the Bankers Trust and Alex Brown businesses, uh, in addition to others, and then uh, JP Morgan, uh, a time in uh, the alternative investment space and private equity in the hedge fund world, uh, and um, uh, really kind of brought me to a place where um, I had a, a, a deep belief in this as um, really the best way to work uh, with clients and, and create really good outcomes for them. Thank you all for sharing that three different path into our industry, a testament in my mind for the heterogeneity of talent that our industry needs and rewards. Thank you for sharing that. In this next round, let's take the client lens and please reflect about our respective business models from the client point of view. Maybe we have the sequence again, be Mindy, Hike, and Jeff. And if you don't mind, share with us who in your mind are the best fitting clients for your particular business models. Where do you see the fit being the greatest between client needs, behaviors, and attitudes and what your respective business model can deliver? So, so our ideal client is usually someone that's going to be going through a transition. That's either going to be a business owner that's exiting their business in five to 10 years. They've got a lot of decisions to make. Um, they're looking at cash flows. They're looking at what they need to either invest in the next business or what they need to maintain their lifestyle. So, um, so someone that's going through a transition that could also be a retiree or an executive with a stock option package and things like that. So they need a lot of tax planning. They've got a lot of complex um, what if scenarios to run through as well as emotional decisions to make. You know, it's really hard when you're the senior person um, in charge of a company and now you're retired and you're really nobody anymore. So helping clients work through both those financial and emotional complex decisions um, and transitions is important to our team. Um, and then all the things that go along with that, estate planning decisions, you know, updating um, with tax changes and tax law changes at making sure that they can align their values to what's important to them. Um, so for example, we had a client that exited a business last year. Um, I knew that they were very philanthropic and we uh, transferred shares of their business into a donor advised fund prior to that sale, which avoided you know, capital gains tax, uh, also offered a large deduction. That allowed us to do a whole bunch of Roth conversion in the same year and use that deduction to offset that. Um, and so there was just a lot of coordination between their CPA, their estate attorney, setting up irrevocable trusts. We really like to be that, you know, personal CFO, like we call it, or, you know, financial quarterback that really can hear the client, what's important to them, what are their concerns, understand where they're trying to get. And, and honestly, uh, one of the things that I think is really important is you know, we're working with really busy people. And, um, you know, as we mentioned, our spouses are, are really important to us. And when you're a business owner, your spouse isn't always involved in the business. And one of the things that I really like best about our role is we help spouses create a shared vision. So we actually go through a whole mind map exercise um, and develop and sort of paint the picture of what do you want your life to be like? You know, where do you want to spend your time with community, you know, with your home, all those different things. 
We help clients create a shared vision together. Um, and we really believe that that leads to a higher level of life satisfaction. So it's not just about the numbers. It's really helping develop a long-term relationship with, with these clients, um, understand what they want to teach their kids, what they want to leave to their kids. So um, there's, there's the emotional and the educational piece. Last year, we drafted uh, a script for a client to help share uh, with his family that, you know, that they had just exited a business and, and what were the changes and how did the family values um, get brought into that? You know, what were their family values? Where did they come from? Stories about his parents and what their goals were, you know, now that they had some some money, some liquidation from this thing, um, from this business sale. And so those are some of the softer things that we do with clients. Um, but really, so we're looking for clients that are, are coachable, that really value advice, that really want a thinking partner. We're the first person they typically call when something happens. Um, and, and, you know, we're running through all those scenarios um, because nothing, you know, we can do a financial plan, but life is changing all the time. And so they frequently have things that come up um, and, and they want someone to help them think through how that, how that impacts their, their long term. Mindy, quick follow up. You mentioned fee only earlier on as a key proposition, you know, in your value offering. What yeah. do you mean by that and how does that resonate with that type of client? That's a great question. Um, you know, there it used to be when I started in the industry, um, you know, fee, what fee only means to answer that question is that we only get paid by our clients. We don't get paid any commission through any investments, through any insurance products. Um, we only get paid cash from our clients. So we don't expect any kickbacks, any trips. Uh, we don't accept any of that. Um, so our, what the, and the reason for that is that we want our clients to know that the advice that we're giving is specific to their needs, that, that it's exactly what they need, that we're not incented to tell them they need life insurance because we're going to get a big commission check. Now, all of that said, I think the majority of, of advisors out there, regardless of whether they get paid commission through a life insurance product or a long-term care product, are really, their goal is to give great advice to their clients. They're looking forward to uh, great relationships. Um, and, but our clients really appreciate the fact that there's no conflicts of interest. And so what I find is that, um, you know, high net worth clients really uh, appreciate that. And, and the other thing that I enjoy is there's so much to know. So yes, I do tax planning, but we don't file taxes. So we'll go through a tax plan and we'll coordinate with their CPA or we'll go through an insurance plan and then we'll coordinate with uh, an insurance agent. And it's nice to have, I like having experts in each of those fields because there's so much to keep up with. Sometimes you miss something or sometimes you don't think about something. Um, and I like collaborating with a, a group of experts, um, but I like being the person who kind of brings it all together for the client and really um, holds those relationships together. Got it. Thank you all for sharing that. Hike over to you. You alluded to it a little bit already in your opening commentary, the breadth of the client set and segments that you get to serve on the vast Raymond James platform is impressive. Please bring that to life a bit for our audience. Thank you, Philip. Uh, there's a couple of things Mindy said I think are really, I want to I want to highlight for the group because I think they're, they're important and they stuck with me. One, the word coachable, right? An ideal client is coachable. And second, uh, another comment Mindy made, I think was really, really important. And uh, I wanna make sure everyone realizes this, that even if they're commission-based product-driven uh, FAs or fee-based advisory-driven FAs, the vast majority of financial advisors are really driven by delivering the best results and best advice for their clients. It's really a sacred role we play in lives. And I commend all of you for having such an interest in wealth management that you're participating in this class um, because it's a really, really important role. But those clients that are coachable, um, that makes it even more important for we as professionals to be real artisans of our craft, to be very good at what we do and to be trustworthy and honest and motivated um, by the best result for our clients. So what's, what's also really interesting is there's two core roles that I think you can put into wealth management. There's financial planning, and then there's true wealth management. You heard many describe what's really financial planning for very wealthy clients, right? But financial planning is something that we can deliver as professionals throughout the life cycle of a client. It's part of why you see Morgan Stanley today 
so focused on the at work segment, meaning they've hired, they've acquired multiple firms that are in the corporate services end of the business so that they can participate in the entire life cycle of a client when they start making money to when they start saving money to when they start moving up in management to when they ultimately retire, perhaps in the C-suite or an entrepreneur <clears throat> who just starts out, et cetera. So that financial planning role takes place throughout, but the wealth management portion of it, which is where the investment expertise comes into play, is oftentimes the preservation of wealth, which is the core role when you're working in wealth management with well-heeled, financially uh, established clientele. Some advisors like to think that the creation of wealth is the role that they're playing for, um, for clients who are not yet uh, centimillionaires or, 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 or decimillionaires. Uh, and, and I think that that's debatable. Uh, I think that it's really important that the responsibility around how you invest uh, for a person's, uh, how you invest an individual or a family's hard earned savings um, has to be within the risk parameters uh, that that client has made it clear they're willing to, to afford. And ironically, the wealthier a client is, the more able they are to take greater risks to make greater money. Uh, and the democratization of alternative investments such as private equity and individual private market investments is presenting opportunity to clients that are not necessarily billionaires, family offices, then to millionaires. And I think that's a real positive thing. And I think we're going to see more and more of that trend over the course of the next uh, many decades, uh, <clears throat> particularly in the next 20 years. So, but from an ideal client standpoint, um, in Alex Brown, the ideal uh, client is a relatively sophisticated client. We actually find that financial professionals are our best clients, a relatively sophisticated um, uh, of a high net worth uh, pedigree. Um, but in Raymond James, every service uh, we provide, financial planning, asset allocation, portfolio management, uh, separately managed accounts, et cetera, um, is deliverable to the breadth, again, to the entire uh, wealth strata. And that goes all the way up to private equity and the ability to deliver a balance sheet from a lending standpoint to clients, so it's a it's a very it's a very diverse set of ideal clients um, uh, from the the Raymond James lens because the firm has built uh, itself up from a capability standpoint to a meaningful size over the past number of decades. Uh, so we're able to serve a much broader set of financial clients and a much broader set of financial advisors who serve those clients. Got it. Very helpful. Quick follow-up question for you, Hike. You alluded to it a little bit in your opening comments already. The way the street and you define success with clients may have evolved dramatically over the past few decades. How do you think about defining success and measuring impact with your clients today? So just as every financial plan, every wealth management mandate is bespoke, success is also bespoke um you know when you're part of a of a large company you know success gets measured if you're doing it properly on the long term on an earnings basis but without successfully delivering financial advice and financial services to clients you're not going to achieve that long-term corporate goal and at raymond james one of the great uh qualities of the firm is that talking about quarterly earnings uh about how a quarter did it's really not viewed as a positive commentary we're very much viewed on the long term. Uh, and, and that's really how we want our advisors to view the role that they're playing for clients. So success for an individual client is based on delivering upon the mandate and the needs of that individual client. Defining success notionally, numerically is impossible um, when it comes to the wealth management profession. It's truly um, an individual client experience. Excellent. Jeff, please bring home this client lens round who does Chevy Chase Trust work with best? Sure, great. Um, so who do we work with? Um, look, our, our clients come from a very broad set of backgrounds. There is, but when I think about really what do they have in common, uh, I'd say a few things. Um, these are very accomplished people. They are experts uh, and sought after in their professions or in their social sphere. Um, they're genuinely interesting people and they're people that uh, we um, and I think others would all, all feel wonderful spending time with. Uh, they tend to be very forward thinking. I think many of them are attracted to our thematic investing approach, 
um, because of that that forward thinking. And I'd say they also have in common uh, that, you know, due perhaps to personal experience or family history, they really see the value of our planning and discretionary and fiduciary services. Um, and they're comfortable uh, delegating to experts, uh, whether that's us or others. You know, these are people who are experts themselves. Um, and uh, I think that they enjoy the opportunity to work with us. Um, we don't aspire to do everything for them. Um, we aspire to do the things that matter most and the subset of those that we can do really well. Um, and we love to work with their experts uh, and we love to introduce them to other experts uh, where when there is something that matters to a client and we don't think that we can be that, um, that top decile provider, uh, we, uh, we love to bring them together with others who um, are experts in that area and who share a similar ethic around uh, client service and achieving um, a client's goals. Um, and we think that that allows us to earn a level of trust, uh, which, um, you know, in turn, our interests, we think, are very well aligned. Again, we're a fee-only model similar to, to what Mindy described. Um, I think I, I might jump in and answer the question that, that you asked, Haig, as well, like how, how would we measure or define success for ourselves? And, um, you know, look, with, with just over a thousand clients, the measures of success are often um, uh, deeply personal and it's really about achieving their goals. Uh, I think across the board, uh, delivering uh, strong investment performance and investment outcomes is important. Uh, and uh, getting there in a high quality, uh, robust, repeatable way is really important. Um, you know, when I look for measures of that success, um, I care a lot about the, the client vote, uh, as it were. And, you know, we, we enjoy a level of uh, retention of around 98% with our clients. Uh, and I'm, I'm also proud of the fact that more than half of our business, in fact, sometimes well in excess of half of our business, comes from uh, new client uh, engagements with us that are sourced through our existing clients who, again, feel comfortable with what we're doing and uh, in a way where they're, they're very willing to uh, bring friends, family, and, and others uh, into the same orbit. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that quick follow-on question to you, Jeff. You alluded to the fact that Chevy Chase Trust is focused on doing a few things, meeting a few needs in the client spectrum very well. That implies that for their other needs, your clients oftentimes work with other providers. A, is that the right way to interpret it? And then B, how do you coordinate the collaboration across providers to meet the client needs? Yeah, so um, again, we, as I said, focus on doing a few things that we think are really important really well. Uh, and we do work with, um, with experts uh, across a whole range of different disciplines. Um, you know, that's something where um, I think of us as a very new firm, but we've, we've, we've been around for, for several decades and we've uh, built, uh, I think, a strong uh, presence in our community and um, developed relationships with uh, a host of what I would characterize as, as like-minded from a client engagement perspective, uh, people and organizations that um, uh, that that happen to have areas of expertise um, that that we think of as uh, necessary and um, accretive or or, or um, good complements to what we're able to do, uh, and that's something that again is is very bespoke and customized, and something that we. Um, you know, that, we, that we tailor to the individual client need. So again, um, those are relationships based on, I think, a level of um, professional experience and respect and diligence uh, with, with those providers uh, and, um, and are, are all cases where there, there's no um, sharing of revenues or fees or, or anything else. Um, we, um, you know, focus on having high quality relationships in the areas where we're expert uh, and um, I, I think um, really enjoy and are, are, are glad when we're able to bring uh, others into 
uh, a client's life who um, have a similar view to our own. So I don't think there's a particular organizational or design secret to that other than um, uh, doing our best to always surround ourselves with, um, with good people and good relationships. Got it. The notion of ecosystems, of partnerships to surround the client and serve them well holistically is certainly on the rise in our industry and here to stay. Let's shift away from the client lens towards the employee lens. And in no particular order, whoever wants to go first, fire away. The question is, what is your value proposition to employees? How do you position yourself to get the best possible talent into your firms? What type of you know employee profiles are good fits versus not so good fits on your platform? Any you know thoughts on those dimensions would be much appreciated. I'll take a first shot at that, Philip. Is that all right? Tim, please. So something I didn't necessarily have an appreciation for at the early part of my career was just how important a culture is inside of a large organization. Uh, and, um, you know, when you're part of a large global bank, such as Deutsche Bank, it's hard to define that culture and execute on, or on a unified culture, particularly when it's an acquisitive organization. Um, but prior to the acquisition of Bankers Trust and Deutsche Bank, Alex Brown had a very defined culture. Uh, and uh, fast forwarding to today with Raymond James, culture is actually one of the core pillars uh, of the organization. And that's a culture that's defined by being conservative, respecting the independence of the financial advisors and integrity. And they live it daily. Um, and so not doing a public service announcement on Raymond James, but much more so on culture. Uh, so when you look at an employee and who's the ideal employee, it's not one um, uh, who is going to necessarily come in and, and um, contribute dramatically to that culture. It's a very positive byproduct if you hire an employee who fits the culture perfectly day one, but more so an employee who is going to be receptive to embracing that culture once they become a part of that organization. That culture permeates the client experience. It permeates the, st the stakeholder experience, and it, and it absolutely permeates the experience that all the associates have throughout the organization. So um, when I think about the ideal employee, I think about one who is going to, to some degree, positively influence the culture, but more so going to embrace uh, and help preserve that culture. That's critically important. I would put that above an MBA from Harvard or any other Ivy League school any day. Um, not to say that education is not critically important, um, uh, and uh, and I include obviously Columbia in that uh, in that peer group. Um, but uh, you, you really have to appreciate as early as you can in your career the value of of culture um, uh, on an organization. Got it, Mindy Jeff. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll echo a little bit of what Haig said. I do think that um, culture is absolutely critical uh, and it's an enormous positive or an enormous negative for, for an organization. Um, and, and it also can be something that's very difficult to discern um, if you are uh, uh, looking at a variety of different firms. So many of them will use similar language. Um, but um, the differences are subtle, but that subtlety can make a huge, huge difference. And so really try to be attuned to that, focus on that, and understand that oftentimes that culture, um, once, once established, can, can, can have an incredible power to it, uh, positive or negative. Um, you know, I, I was drawn to Chevy Chase Trust by the intense focus on the client that I saw here when um, when I when I was talking to the organization. And so I'd say that, you know, the kind of employee who's going to really enjoy uh, uh, a career here and thrive in this environment is someone who who is, you know, intelligent, forward looking, forward thinking, but really at their core focused on doing right by the client um, always. And um, and I think that's something that uh, we really pride ourselves on. And um, I, I was uh, very fortunate to to inherit uh, in coming here and, and intend to to really um, 
push to maintain and even strengthen that further. Um, you know, I think that the value proposition, if, 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 if you will, for someone looking at us is, uh, you know, this is a solid privately held organization uh, that's built for the long haul and built to be intensely focused on achieving client goals and outcomes. Um, and I think uh, that's a timeless benefit to being here. I think there's also a more temporal one, which is that uh, we are embarking on a really exciting next chapter of growth. Um, and I personally have always found it most enjoyable to be present at the creation of that kind of uh, a chapter of growth. Uh, and then finally, I think, um, you know, being an organization that is, um, uh, I'd say, small enough that an individual coming in can have a really large personal impact on the business um, is, is another thing that I think makes this a, a very appealing place. That is a very nice and natural lead over to the many, many smaller mid-sized RIA shops out there. Mindy, what are your thoughts on this question? You know, you've heard a lot, a lot of great information, both Jeff and Hike. Um, you know, culture is really important. I remember when I went to work for Morgan Stanley, all their advertisements were around financial planning and clients and you got there and it was really about how many assets you were bringing through the door. I'm not to say that it's like that anymore, but what I thought I was getting into wasn't really the job that I was getting into. So I think really understanding the structure of the organization. I thought it was interesting that Jeff pointed out his organization was a private organization. Um, the other thing that surprised me, or I don't know why, about Morgan Stanley when I was there a long time ago was that it was a it was a public organization in 2008 when budgets were getting cut. Um, you know, uh, you you lost a lot of your support. And so just thinking about how what motivates uh, the business that you're going to go work for, um, how how are they how are you going to be compensated? Is it um, an advice focused business or is it a sales focused business? Um, so in in some roles, you know, we need a little bit of everybody at all of our organizations, and some organizations has have people that are focused on sales. And if what really excites you is um, closing the deal or doing that, you need to be part of an organization that, you know, is competitive maybe, or, 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 you know, is, um, you know, is a good fit for you. Our organization is tiny um, and we're growing fast. Um, and I'm looking to, to grow advisors and the kind of advisors that we're looking for are people who are good at working with teams. We have a team approach to working with our clients. I'm guessing that you guys probably, um, do as well in your organization. So do you like working in a team? Um, or do you like being the lead person? Uh, we're looking for people who are just naturally curious um, and authentic and really just uh, love to learn. So we invest a lot in our employees. We pay for their CFPs. Um, we're sending them to uh, to, to conferences. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of ongoing education around even just client discussions, not even the technical things, but just how do you have those conversations? Are there better tools to have those conversations out there? Um, we do investment management as well, but um, the investment management decisions don't have to be made necessarily by the advisor. The advisor is trying to understand the risk profile of the client. Um, and so we're looking for people who may not be great at um, making investment uh, decisions for their clients, but can understand what their risk profile looks like, understand their planning needs and can bring it back um, to the team that's that's uh, managing our investments and can make those uh, decisions for that for that client. So we really care about people who love planning, love long term client relationships, um, are really good at having uh, having hard conversations and making it easy for the client to understand. I would say that communication is one of the most important things that we're looking for in an employee. We can teach employees anything. We can send them to training, but we need to make sure that they're um, that they that they hold themselves accountable. We're human. They admit when they're wrong. They um, they do their very best. Um, everybody we want, you know, everybody wants a players on their team. But I find that if you hire someone that doesn't fit that mold, it just holds everybody else back. Um, and when you're a tiny organization like my, like my company is, uh, you know, just that one person can make a big difference. Um, so so we're really looking um, looking for people that. Uh, can work as a team and uh, are client focused. But I, I would say that as someone looking for a new role, um, what do you know? What do you not know? Do you like working with that kind of client? Um, we talked earlier about, do you have clients that you like to hang out with? I love working with business owners 
because they're like me. I'm a business owner. They're visionary. They're interesting. Um, I know I can add a lot of value because what they do best is not what I do best. And so we can step in and provide that. Um, so think about, you know, what kind of clients can you work with there? What's the platform? So, you know, uh, I talked a, a lot about investment platform and then thematic investing with Jeff. What is the firm that you're looking at? What do they focus on? About 80 80 to 90 percent of our clients are in um, sustainable portfolios here. I live on a farm, right? We attract like people, people who care about the environment. Um, you want to be in a place where there's people who care about the same things as you. And that's a culture thing. So, um, you know, ask a lot of questions when you're going to interview firms um, and, and talk to see how they work. Do they work in teams? Who do they work with? Do you like the kind of people they work with? If you want to work with a different niche, does the platform that they offer um, offer you the ability to do that? A small firm like mine, you know, might not be the right fit. You might be better off somewhere else. So I think really understanding what your goals are, what kind of position you want. Is it going to be, you know, advice focused where you're not out trying to grow the business um, and you're really only growing through referrals, which is which is growth, but you're not out. Um, you're not a rainmaker is what we would call it normally in our business. But what what is your role going to be? Um, and does that firm offer you the ability to do that and also um, to grow? One of the things we're working on at my firm right now is what does your career path look like? Right. As a small firm, we often don't have a, a really long career path. And so building that out is really important to me as we grow. Mindy, excellent time to transition from the panel discussion to Q&A. We've been getting great questions from the audience. Quick observation, though, on this round when it comes to employee fit. Super interesting to me, A, to observe that Hive started with culture and you end with culture. That's certainly a red thread uh, going throughout. Secondly, to my ears at least, a lot of commonalities and overlap in what you're looking for with nuances of difference between the different channels. And that's certainly a good thing for the many early and mid-career folks we have in the audience. Now, with respect to questions from the audience, let me feed some in and it goes very natural. Maybe first question to you, Mindy and Haik. You've been active, successful advisors that then grew into sort of management positions. Looking back, what would be one or two things you wish you had known or done earlier? You know, what do you regret having discovered later in your life versus early in your professional life? Think of it as tips for aspiring young mid-career financial advisors. Hike, I think you're mute. Mindy, Mindy, you or me, because for me, this one pops right out in my mind. So, Go ahead first. Yeah, so I very clear, and so this is a very specific answer, Philip, but it's, it's reflective of a bigger issue. Uh, I wish I knew that uh, the dynamic of the credit markets, that when uh, uh, rates go up, bond prices come down. It's that simple, right? So think about it. Here I am, a, 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 a graduate in political science from Rutgers University, and I get hired as a financial advisor at a wirehouse because, as I said earlier, 20, 30 years ago, it was a sales job, right? And I put a client in a very, very conservative U.S. government bond fund, and rates spike, and the year is 1993. And uh, that client got hurt. That client lost like 15% of the value uh, of their money. And, you know, I never, ever forgot that. I never got over that. Um, and the client was very forgiving, very understanding. We, we, we made the necessary changes and in the long run, it worked out financially. But from a lesson standpoint, that's a very specific example of what I wish I knew. So I think that's a reflection of the fact that historically, our profession had the wrong priorities. It became a volume business, a sales business. Um, and I'm very pleased. Unfortunately, it's been the result of multiple crises and many people getting hurt. Uh, but our profession has gotten much better at being true uh, 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 deliverers of a sacred obligation as wealth managers. And um, so that, that my answer is very specific, Philip, but um, uh, it's a it's a reflection. I, I, I want to see our profession continue to get better and better and better at the advice part of what we do. And that means 
we as financial professionals have to understand every aspect of the investments platform and spectrum. Mindy, anything to add? I think that's I think that's absolutely great advice, and I and I think just to to add on to that, uh, the the point is is setting expectations with clients. Not only us knowing it, but being able to communicate expectations clearly with clients, so that when you, you can't control the markets, right? They're going to go down. They're going to go up. Get great tools so that you can help clients know what to expect. So when their portfolio is down ten percent, they can go you know what, Mindy told me that this was going to happen. Like, this is what you expect to have the long-term returns that, that that they've planned for. So I think not only educating ourselves is taking the time to walk clients through those things and know that they change their minds over time. So a client of mine sold a business, first big wealth, large liquidation event. Markets were going up. Portfolio did great this year. He was super happy. You know what? He changed his mind. We just went through what you could expect based on your current risk profile, what other risk pro profiles. We had him redo his risk tolerance questionnaire, and he's decided to pull risk off the table. He doesn't really need the growth. We've talked about high net worth people. They have two opportunities. They can take more risk because they have more money, or they can take less risk because they don't need the growth. And really trying to understand what your client's goals are and revisit it and, um, and call when the markets are down just because you've told them it it doesn't mean that they're going to remember when the markets are down. They always say to me, I always just feel better when I talk to you. I know what you say. You send me emails out. Don't be afraid of those conversations and be honest. You don't know what's going to happen, but explain how you've planned for it. So just do a really good job educating clients and know that setting those expectations and educating them is what is is why they're going to love you. You can't control what's out there. And it's really hard being in a field that you can't control what's going to happen tomorrow and the and that news changes every day. Yet I hear from you the power of the pre-lived experience and what that can do in a relationship. And I hear from you the power of human interaction, that element of the advisory relationship and how important it will be going forward. With three minutes to go, I'm going to combine two audience questions to you, Jeff. Given your career journey, you have a uniquely strategic view on our industry. Please share with us your quick thoughts on which channels, which business models do you see thriving and perhaps growing faster than others going forward? And what may that mean for long term career opportunities for new or mid career financial advisors? I think it's critical to understand and to remember that, particularly here in the United States, it is a very, very big ocean out there, and uh, there, uh, there, there is room in that ocean for pretty much every operating model that exists today, and every operating model someone could um, could conjure up. Um, you know, if you go back to that slide that Philip shared at the very beginning of of our time together, um, I can remember drawing similar versions of that slide. Um, 20 years ago. Uh, and I think if you'd looked at this 20 years ago, you would have seen, uh, first of all, um, uh, a far smaller market in that above 5 million category. You know, we, we, we've benefited from um, incredible wealth creation across the board um, and also a level of, unfortunately, a, a level of excessive perhaps wealth concentration. Uh, over, over that 20 year period. So you would certainly notice some changes in the shape of, of where the market was from a wealth perspective. But you'd also, uh, I think back then, have seen a, a much larger market share in the wirehouse space, most likely, uh, than you do today. And you would have also seen certainly quite a few boutique investment advisors. Uh, they would have been a far smaller part of the market. And so um, I think that over the last two decades, you've seen a fairly steady migration um, I think driven by that desire to align interests between clients and their providers toward a fee-based model. Uh, and the chart here, and even if you diffed it with the same chart 20 years ago, would actually understate that migration because you have um, quite a lot of fee-based business that would be uh, in, in really all of the columns on this page. Um, you know, I think uh, when I think about that old Alex Brown business, which at one point was probably 90 plus percent commission and margin business, 
um, you know, a lot of those client relationships there and elsewhere migrated more toward a fee-based, um, I think more long-term perhaps aligned model. Um, so certainly, look, I, I've, I've voted with my feet and with my resume um, toward, toward that fee-based model. And so I expect that that will probably be where you see a continued shift uh, in terms of the, of, of the model there. Um, but I don't think that that means you're going to see the demise of any of these other models. Uh, they are very appealing to certain clients. Uh, I, I've, I've met clients who just, um, they really like paying commissions. They, they equate that with matching the compensation with the work effort. Um, and, you know, so, uh, and, and then you'll find um, models that are far more focused on, um, you know, kind of client do it yourself um, or kind of self serve models. So I don't think that um, for for those of you who are on on this and are thinking about where you may want to um, make your career, I think that uh, there there is room in every one of these models. And I'd say that there's always room for the very best. So I'd focus more on on being really really good at what you do. And um, and I, I probably sound like a broken record in saying this, but I think really at the end of the day success to me in this industry is about focusing on the client um, and that that's always going to lead you to the right outcome, either at the individual client level or um, at, at a more aggregate level. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Hike, for your invaluable perspectives. It's time to wrap this up. I am sure the audience got their own takeaways. One of my top three quotes from today's discussion include from Mindy, we help spouses create a shared vision, something very powerful there, thinking about the client universe holistically. From Hayek, what I took away is many things, including an ideal client is coachable. To me, that gets at the two-way street that any good advisory relationship has to be. And Jeff really drove it home by emphasizing that the measure of success is highly personal it's all about the clients achieving their goals. Those three statements stuck away with me. And in my mental mind, guess where I'll be going for dinner tonight? It will be with, uh, uh, with the RBG, with Hike's wife, and with Eisenhower. I cannot wait for that interesting dinner discussion. Thank you all for joining. All the very best.